Thank you very much for that speech. I now look to Geneva Roy, Brazenose College Secretary's Committee, to open the case for the opposition. Thank you, Mr. President, and thank you, members, both past and present, for the opportunity to speak in such a topical and what I'm sure will be a huge debate. <laughs> when I got asked to speak tonight, I not only was honoured, but incredibly excited. As a second year undergraduate politics student with absolutely zero electoral experience, I was a privilege to be presenting arguments that I'm sure will be more coherent and more realistic than some of those presented 3,611 miles away in Washington, DC. <laughs> Yet, my friends, as all good friends should, were sure to ground me as soon as I told them I would be speaking on opposition side tonight. With such encouraging comments as, is there even an opposition to that motion? <laughs> and, wow, you're gonna lose so badly. And my personal favorite, don't worry, I'm sure you'll get some pity votes, right? But, as the avid debater that I am, and who commonly enjoys playing devil's advocate, as many of my friends will tell you, I take the challenge to tonight to convince not only my unsupportive friends, but also you as the audience to agree with the counterintuitive side of this motion. I will not attempt to convince you to agree with Trump, even I won't endure that uphill battle, but I will prove that one can simultaneously identify with the Democratic Party, as I myself do, although the red jurist may su su suggest otherwise, while also appreciating the destructive threat that impeachment serves not only to democracy, to America, but also to the entire world. In light of recent comments to liken Trump to Darth Vader, and in wake of a release of a new Star Wars film next month, I'll bring three episodes to the house tonight in order to convince you to walk through that door, Mark Ney. Episode one, the constitutional menace. Here, I will explore why the impeachment of Trump is not only redundant as a political procedure, but strips voters of the fundamental democratic right to determine their governing body. Episode two, the nationalists strike back. <laughs> Next, I will prove why impeachment ruins the Democratic Party's political momentum through, through engaging Trump's base and further polarizing the American political scene. And the final episode, episode three, the return of the Democrats. Finally, I will explore the harms of crowding out discussions on issues like healthcare and the economy, and outline why through only not impeaching do the Democrats stand any chance of winning in November 2020. But first, it falls upon me the honor to introduce the proposition bench today. You just heard from Oliver Tushingham, a second year PP student at St. John's and the chair of the consultancy committee. Now, Ollie and Trump share some similar corollaries that might not seem evident at first. Alike to Trump, Ollie has maintained power within the union despite never actually winning a popular vote. <laughs> and, to make matters worse, continues to grasp on control despite continuing to have no electoral experience. But we're so great to have Ollie still with us today despite his best attempts to resign from office three days into the term. <laughs> Second, you'll hear from James Carville, Bill Clinton's 1992 president campaign manager. With a history of switching sides, first commentating on CNN before moving to Fox News, I'm sure Mr. Carville will feel right at home in the Oxford Union. <laughs> but, Having also worked on the 1988 impeachment response of Bill Clinton, Mr. Carvel has excellent experience about lying about blatant, truthful facts. And I'm sure you will notice him and see him at ho afterwards in Turf Tavern, consuming only responsible and legal substances alike that of his previous boss. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, you will hear from Andrew Adonis, a current Labour MP, MP and close personal friend of one Brendan McGrath. Now, you would not be wrong if you think that you recognise Mr Adonis. However, do not be fooled that this is for any professional or political achievements. For those, I can guarantee you, they are lacking. But, 
you will notice that he has spoken in previously two union debates at the Oxford Union. Very lost for a cause, I'm sure Andrew hopes that the third time really will be the charm. And honestly, I'm a little bit surprised that Andrew's actually been invited back here, seeming in his first debate, he appeared to endorse James Lamming, the presidential opposition candidate to his friend, Brendan McGrath. With a very poor track record of supporting the winning side, I'm sure Andrew will fit right at home on side proposition. <laughs> Mr. President, these are your guests, and they are most welcome. <laughs> stuff. Episode 1, The Constitutional Menace. It is first important to understand exactly what impeachment will in reality look like, because the decision to Congress impeach is very distinct from the decision to physically remove the President from office. Because after and if Congress votes to impeach, Senators are then given the chance to vote on whether to convict and actually remove President Trump from office. And let's be very clear on this front. The disproportionate power that small rural states possess in the House of Senate ensures the probability of achieving a two-thirds majority is practically non-existent. But, oh, apologies. But even ignoring the procedural issues with the proposition's case, impeachment in the specific issue of Trump is inappropriate and unlawful. Impeachment wasn't designed to put a president on trial in circumstances where the public was fully informed about the relevant evidence and the polls showed an even split. But don't let the proposition convince you otherwise. Trump impeachment is not like that of previous presidents. Because unlike Nixon or Clinton, who were in their second term, Trump stands to face election in under a year. Impeachment should not be used to remove a president when an election to allow voters the right to decide is under a year away. If the case put forward by the proposition is true in all its merits that it claims it to be, then they should be willing to trust the American public to make the decision come 2020 about Trump's future, rather than having the audacity to make it for them. <laughs> Episode two, the nationalists strike back. Recognize that Trump has long seemed to invite the opportunities to convert the electoral campaign into a further highly media-sized circus over his fitness for office. As he has already amply demonstrated, he is far better suited for personality politics than actually running the country. Impeachment therefore allows Trump to shape himself as a martyr. Trump's base has become increasingly partisan over the last few years and they care less and less about his supposed misdeeds. The fact that they see in any attempt to discredit him is confirmation of the narrative that the country's establishment are conspiring to prevent the popular agenda of the people. The benefits of impeachment that you hear from side proposition rely on one simple factor, the Senate actually removing Trump from office. So let us look about what exactly would happen if for some magical reason the Democrats could convince sufficient Republicans to find their souls and convict Trump. If the Washington political elite successfully removed from office a legitimately elected and very widely supported US president, it will act as a catalyze, catalyst to the already polarized nation into something approaching nothing less than a cultural war. An already dangerously polarized and partisan country would further divide as people on opposing sides hunker down deeper into their camps and cling harder to their chosen narratives. We saw in 2018 that higher turnout for Trump's base had the potential to swing battleground states. Given the Democratic space exists heavily in coastal, urban areas, racking up popular support is no use and makes no difference to winning the Electoral College and evidently the White House. Even in the event of Trump's removal from office, a further enraged nationalist base is guaranteed to continue support nationalist policies and the next national frontman or woman. If America is going to continue on a tenable as a collection of states going forward, the Democrats need to get those people to switch away from the nationalist rhetoric. Impeachment makes that practically untenable. 
So then, what, as I'm sure proposition will question, is the alternative? If Trump leaves office in a normal routine, his supporters will not be able to posture that he was removed by political judicial means, but by the ordinary process of a constitutional democracy. He is a symptom, no thank you, not the cause of a cultural disaffection of mostly white, blue-collar Americans who have themselves felt abandoned by the Democrats. Impeachment not only compounds that illusion, ladies and gentlemen, but it places the White House further out of the Democratic Party's reach. But the final episode of my speech tonight, episode three, return of the Democrats. Dang. The reality, however, is that Republican senators are not going to convict Trump in a sufficient numbers, particularly given that all but three Republican senators voted for a motion to condemn the impeachment process. Trump knows this, and as a result, although it may appear counterintuitive, impeachment is what Trump wants the Democrats to do. Why is that? Because it will provide his chaotic and often immature administration with a focus and a purpose. As the impeachment net closes in around him, he will set the political agenda and play the victim. If there is one thing that Trump can do, it is to pay the game and to play it very well. If Trump is not removed from office after impeachment, the Democrats will be forced on the campaign trail to defend day in and day out the accusations of the elites and the swamps trying to steal the power from the people and seeking to overturn the 2016 election result. This will also force Democrats away from issues such as healthcare and the economy, issues that Democrats need to win in order to swing voters in Rust Belt states in the presidential campaign. They cannot afford to spend, ladies and gentlemen, more time playing Trump's game. They need to spend time convincing voters that Democratic economic cause cases in which they will enable swing voters to become more prosperous. They need to show voters that they care about what really matters to them more than Trump does. A Democratic presidential candidate can win and can defeat Trump in 2020, but they must be willing to convince voters that their policies can uniquely remedy their issues. There is a definite risk that impeachment and the resulting political fallout of the Senate trial, which results in Trump not being removed from office, distracting from the underlying and crucial issues that matter to voters. If that happens, impeachment may feel to achieve only its easiest goal of actually benefiting the democratic process. Therefore, ladies and gentlemen, I ask you tonight to not fall into the trap that our unfortunate proposi proposition speakers have. To resist the urge to want to impeach Trump, given the arguments on the surface, but to actually look deeper at the inevitable disastrous impact on the Democratic Party and the Rust Belt voters. While impeaching Trump certainly brings a degree of entertainment, do not let, you, do not let proposition convince you to play on Trump's terms. Because Democrats will be better serving out how to work and win the ballots in 2020 rather than attempting to remove him in 2019. Ladies and gentlemen, I ask you for the last time to not focus on winning the short-term battles, but to work through the door labeled nay this evening to focus on winning the war. Thank you.